Welcome everyone to another book discussion between the Ann Arbor District Library and the Unerased Book Club. This evening we are discussing Brown Girls, which is a novel by Daphne Palasi Andreas. And before we get started, uh, we should go around and introduce ourselves and just say a little bit about who we are so people can identify us with our voices. I'll start. I am Lucy and I work in the youth department at the Ann Arbor District Library, but I also do adult programming as well. I am a female with white skin, uh, 50 years old with shoulder length, brown hair and green glasses, and I'm sitting in front of a wall of watercolors. Hi, I'm Emily. I am a librarian at the Ann Arbor District Library. I buy books for kids, but I do events for adults. I am a white woman in my mid-30s. I've got long, wavy, reddish hair. I'm wearing a green shirt, and I'm sitting in front of a white wall with a print of Matisse's goldfish behind me. My name is Jacob. I am an employee at Ann Arbor District Library where I work in the outreach department. I am a 29 year old white male with blonde hair and a beard sitting in front of a white wall and a bookshelf. I will hop in. My name is Beth Manuel. I am also on the outreach team at the Ann Arbor District Library. Um, I am a 61 year old white woman with uh, dark hair, salt and pepper, mostly pepper. And um, behind me are some plants and a couple of windows. Hi folks, I'm Fatima Hawk. I am a co-facilitator of the Unerased Book Club. I am a South Asian woman with uh, light brown skin and uh, long black hair. And I have a digital background of fluffy pink clouds behind me. And I'm Sheila. I am the founder of the book club and co-facilitator with Fatima. I am a light-skinned brown woman in my early 30s with long hair and um, wearing a pink shirt. And behind me is a blurred, very blurred um, filter on, on the basement I'm currently in. And I'll let Amanda introduce herself when she's ready. Hi, everybody. Sorry I'm late. I'm so That's happy okay. to be here to discuss this book tonight. My name is Amanda. I'm a library technician in the youth department at the library, and I love to be part of these discussions. I am a middle-aged white female with shoulder-length wavy dark brown hair and dark brown glasses. Thank you. So the way that we love to introduce all of our book clubs is very simply, what did you think about the book? Oh, sorry. I should actually pause. I'm sorry. I'm very, I'm feeling a little out of practice. Um, like Lucy said, this is a novel. Um, it is a multi-person perspective of um, what it's like to be a brown girl in uh, in New York at a certain period of time. Um, and it has gone on, this book has gone on to win a lot of awards, gain a lot of recognition. Um, and we'll talk about, I'm sure we'll talk about what about it makes it so special. So there, from there, I'd like to open it up and ask people, how did you like it? Or how did you find it? I loved this book. Uh, I read it when it first came out. I don't remember how I stumbled across a free publication review of it, but I got first in line it for a library copy and read it over the course of a day or so when it came out in January of 22. And I was really excited to have the chance to revisit it, uh, especially to talk about it with people who have read it, because it is kind of a hard book to explain, but there's a lot of pieces of it that are worth delving into. So I, I was happy to revisit. I listened to the audiobook, um, which I would not necessarily recommend. I think you miss a lot of the visual jokes um, when you don't see the writing. And it is a it's a beast of an audiobook to narrate because you're representing so many people in so many different cultures. Uh, and the woman who narrated it did a beautiful job um, with voices and uh, read it very much like you might stereotypically expect poetry to be read with lots of dramatic pauses at line breaks. And I found that the experience of reading it myself and letting it wash over me uh, was one that I would recommend strongly. 
well, I also listen to the audiobook, but and that's the only way I've digested it. I flipped through the book to look at the visuals that I missed out on, um, knowing that it's a book that has such, you know, po poetic rhythm to it. So I wanted to at least have the physical book in my hand and look at it. But I really love the audiobook. It's only four hours, which is a great audiobook for me. And I like the sing songiness. I like the way the narrator wrote it. And I felt like I was watching to somebody on a stage doing this four hour like spoken word performance. And I was in it the way that the way that they narrated it, there was such like enthusiasm and just like the softness and you you still got the humor and the drama and what was going on with the girls. But I, I really enjoyed the book. I was very happy to read it. And I feel like I put this on my hold list before I knew this was coming up for this discussion. I can't remember which came first. So I was very happy. I'm very happy to have read it and to be here discussing it with everybody. So I do give a thumbs up to the audio. That's interesting to hear two perspectives. Um, and we'll hear more. But um, yeah, I, I liked the book. I My initial thought as I read it, not knowing what to expect um, and how the multi-protagonists were um, part of the story, but so initially uh, talking about the the youth period, I was I was really kind of reflective of people that I knew in grade school and stuff, and um, and then as as everyone was aging, I would I found myself really less like not it wasn't as relatable. Like I I wasn't that wasn't my life, you know, and I and it kind of made me sad. It's like oh I I totally get this. I totally get this. Like oh, I think I'm seeing where my gaze is different, you know? I'm a middle-aged white woman, <clears throat> but it was good. I really liked it. Um, I, I really enjoyed the collective narrative voice. I thought that that was really um, unusual. And I, I loved the way it kind of made it feel like a chorus, you know, like this, Greek chorus of voices um, sharing their experiences. I think I've read maybe like two other novels that were like this, and they're so embedded in my memory because of how unusual that is. Um, so I think it's a really good way to sort of, you know, share details and and tell a story. Um, and I, yeah, I like the writing. Um, besides that, I also loved the way that Queens was a character in this book as well. I haven't read a lot of books that have taken place in Queens and it was interesting to read about an ethnically diverse group of people in like the most ethnically diverse, you know, city um, in America for sure. But, you know, it, it's, it's so, um, yeah, I really, it took me like two days to read. So um, I just kind of couldn't put it down. I also really enjoyed um, this reading experience. This would be the first book that I've read, uh, the collective, uh, what's the, you know what I'm trying to say, the we that I've read um, that uses the, the collective singular in this way. Um, I like that it was lyrical, that at times it felt like a poem or uh, like a piece of lyric but still while still being a novel. It's amazing how many things this book is for being 200 pages long. It's so many things. Um, and I think that the collective singular voice lends to that as well. Really enjoyed it. I read the Kindle version of the book, so I didn't realize it was only 200 pages, which is fascinating. Um, and I'm also loving the fact that we all read different this book in different format and shout out to accessibility. More of this, please. Um, I loved this book. Um, I saw a lot of stories that it, like of my own life and the people that I, I grew up with in this book. And I think that made it very special. Um, but I also felt like every single vignette could then be expanded into an entire novel, right? Just, just, or a short story or something. There's so many, there's so much richness and content um, in the book and the individual vignettes that I, I was really pulled towards it. Um, the collective we also is fairly new to me. The first time I read it was actually the Buddha in the attic, which uh, was an unerased book club read. 
a couple of years ago and uh, um and I was blown away by it then because again you can capture so much um so many different perspectives and experiences and still find commonality within a lot of differences uh through through that style and it takes a lot of craft and genius to be able to to do it well I think uh, so I I just thoroughly enjoyed myself yeah um, Beth, to your point about not relating or it just being feel like the story's being so outside of what you know, or outside, not so outside, but outside of what you know. Um, well, there's something very specific about these experiences that are also kind of alien to to me. Um, there's the fact it's the intersection of location, immigration status, um, race and ethnicity, and then class very specifically, which um like it, it, that through line of class um, is why so many of these different like cultural differences um, aren't exacerbated, and their some their uh, experiences are so similar. Because if you take class out of it, all of a sudden, um, most of these uh, similarities go out the window, and you're able to focus more on the cultural differences that play out once you have. Um, financial stability, or you're not worried about like the men in your lives being picked up by police, or you're not worried about, um, or like as routine as what we see in the novel. Um, and I think that's really, it's really important to recognize that like, I, you didn't feel like, uh, you felt like it was um, a little outside of your experience box. Same here, completely. And that's what I really enjoyed about, it was challenging and enjoyable at the same time. Um, because there's like such a specific like brown girl experience that's projected and this is not it. Um, and that's what I really, yeah, I, I really uh, valued this now being part of the cultural zeitgeist, at least in like brown girl culture world. Well, I also took note as to, I felt like the author was inviting us into the dregs of Queen to experience or to learn about some of the experiences of these brown girls. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm a girl and I had some of these, the, some of the female experiences, but I didn't grow up brown. I was not like a, a first or second generation immigrant, but I felt like with the writer, the way it was written and especially listening to the audio, I just felt like it was an invitation to have a glimpse into this experience. So I really, I really, I'm appreciative for that. And I'm, it's, it's a, it was a really cool way to um, go through Queens. There's something very immersive about the use of we, uh, but I love that it was also not used anonymously. There are so many names in this book, and I loved that the nod, some of the names were very clearly names that uh, tend to belong to a particular culture. Some were not, uh, but that really did feel like the the all-encompassing of it. Um, Sometimes when I'm reading books from communities that don't mirror my own life, I not necessarily badly feel this, but I feel othered. And this way, and in fact, it's a great thing. It's wonderful to to feel the feel the other and learn things. But this I felt like drawn right in. And like you were saying, Amanda, some of the experiences, I think about that figuring out who you are in in high school and in college and figuring out seeing your friends and going those different paths of life. There's, there's something to that that is so relatable, even if they are not following the exact path that you did. And I think the we allowed me to just feel belonging in this book where I, I probably wouldn't belong if I was actually a character in it. And it was fascinating. Yeah, I would, I would agree with both of you in the sense that like the we is um, this invitation and it felt inclusive in a way, even if these were not the people that you are, or you don't even know people like this, but then there were some things, I think even just being, even if you hadn't been to Queens, but like the, there's one part where they're talking about, um, you know, men looking at them and zipping their flies about all this, like, and I just think, I remember like, if you've lived in a city, well, at least in my experience, that is part of the female experience, I think, you know, like, um, so it just was interesting to see little glimpses where one of the intersections was being a girl, but then outside of that, there were so many other things that were coming into these intersections 
that were that were so new and that I was learning so much about. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I was thinking of the like in the high school years when the guys boys are coming out of them and there's a lot of you know interplay with each other. Uh, that part I was like I could I could just remember you know walking down the halls and seeing groups of people and hey baby you know just uh, all of that was coming back to me. Um, and it just because it is the female experience, you know. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of it was relatable. And also, I kept imagining just seeing these young, these people on the streets just living their life. And, and that's what it was like. It was like a narration of, of a life. It was cool. I, I'm curious, though, Lucy, what, besides Buddha and the Attic, what was the other book you said that was a we? Um, I read a book called The Wives The Wives of Los Alamos. Uh, it was written by Tara Shea Nesbitt. I think it came out in like 2014. And it is about the wives of the scientists who are employed um, to work on the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. And it's really, I really recommend it. It's really interesting because again, it's that collective first person narration. And these wives are going through this similar experience, but they don't know they're talking about their life in the New Mexico desert. They've sort of been taken there, put there because of what their husbands are doing. They don't really know what is going on. None of them do, you know, until the actual final, like the bombs fall in Japan and then everything is, is revealed to the people who were living there and even some of the people who were working on it, what was going on. So it was just really, a, I think the we in that sense really worked well to, um, sort of keep some of it some of it unknown but like they were sharing they were together in what they weren't knowing and and that was the I think the first book that I read with the collective um first person and it has stuck in my mind since then because of that really unusual way of of telling the story yeah thanks mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting that all three of the examples that we can think of happen to be featuring the lives of women um, in the collective voice. We, um, I don't, there's one more short story that I read in Sun Magazine uh, several years ago that also employed the we at, um, narrative. And it was about, um, uh, what do you call um the the woman who get married to men through through like a catalog um, mail order brides like a mail order yeah mail order brides yeah and so it was a very specific uh, Eastern European country um, like and and woman from them from there moving to America um, but I just think that it's very fascinating that it's woman <laughs> you know um, and I wonder why that is I don't I don't have an answer to it but I'm curious about it. I was thinking that too when we were talking about it and I was thinking it was like some sense of solidarity, but there's also this sense of like um, women's stories kind of being pushed aside or, or uh, silenced a little bit or like, you know, the story that you're all going to tell us together, that's good enough. We just need the one. And it, and it takes a little bit of breaking into in this really unusual narrative style to show you that this is not one story, you know, this is many stories, but I, I um it, I was thinking I'm like these are all books written by women so interesting. Um, a very cursory search for um, books that utilize the first person plural narr narration style. There are very very few. Um, like the Seattle Public Library list has 15. Goodreads has about 26. On somebody else's curated list, the fact that it's such a niche um, literary tool is fascinating because it's clearly impactful in the longevity with which a book stays with you. I think it would be very hard to use effectively, which might be part of the reason why there's, there's so few that people recommend. Because even though you might think that we makes it a little anonymous, it really, you have to have a stronger sense of both the collective character and your individual characters. And I think that is definitely something that Brown Girls really has. Like, I would love to just sit and talk with the author and 
tell her to tell me more because we know that she knows more about some of these individual girls. And I, with it being only 200 pages, I mean, gosh, how she, she told the story. She didn't need more pages to tell the story, but it made me want to know so much more about everyone. And you can on Wednesday, we're interviewing her on Instagram live. So 6 p.m. <laughs> um, I was going to say too, that with this being the author's debut novel, it's a pretty, I think it's a really bold and really cool choice. But a lot of us have mentioned that, or some of you have mentioned that it's this female voice, this sisterhood, this solidarity. And I think that it does give the, in here, in this book, particularly, this is my only experience with this format is it does give that the voice is even louder and stronger because they are a we. It's not just like so and so and so and so and so and so. It is we, we brown girls, we of the Dregs of Queens. And so I thought that was more powerful because I could, when I was listening to the audio, I could picture this giant group of all of these girls like on a stage together, like just with their, their arms out, we, we, we sharing their experience. Because even though their families came from, from different areas of the world, there are still, they still have these collective experience of some of the, um, not so much the expectations from their family, but just like family stuff, um, be having brown skin or being other, like in these school situations, there's that collective piece. They were, you're stronger together. You're stronger as a unit. And I think that is, yeah, really, it was a bold choice for the author with her debut. I think that was impressive. So. I do. Yes. And I also agree that like, with the point made earlier about how you have to truly know your subject in order to write this book. And I think that uh, that came through. The, for, after the first time I read it, one of the questions that I wondered about is like, if I, you know, if I were to write a short story or a longer piece in the We Collective, what is it, what is something that I would be capable of writing? Because I know that subject so well. Um, and it's just a fun little query to roll around in my head as of like still trying to figure out which we is it that like that I could potentially represent. So that's also fun. There was a like, lot. Oh, go ahead. Um, I feel like when the author decided to use the we, I uh, about halfway through the book, I thought to myself, what a huge task to represent a diverse group of women, a, di a diverse group of people. Um, and as I read the book, I was like, oh, the author pulled it off. Um, but also, am I the person who gets to decide if she pulled it off or not? I don't know. Um, but I, I, I was moved by the uh, immenseness and audacity of such a task. You know, it makes me think about, gosh, I, how do you follow up a debut like this? I mean, I hope she writes more because I want to read more of her writing, but uh, gosh, what a, what a task ahead. <laughs> Quite intimidating. Um, we started to touch on a little bit about the different themes in the book, such as class um, and uh, intergenerate. This story is also very intergenerational. We get multiple generations of women. And I'm curious, like, what your thoughts are on about some of the similarities or differences among the generations. And how, and also maybe if you want to think about the experience of nostalgia, um, because there's a, quite a lot of that as well embedded throughout. Something that resonated me hugely with this book was the um, relationship between immigrant mother and daughter in that intergenerational uh, space. Um, uh, it was amazing to to read about how complicated um, these characters felt to excel academically. And then their mothers would also be like, what, what is this all about? So it's this like, uh, th that was a dichotomy or two things that were at odds with each other that I had never, uh, considered until reading this book. Um, so that's one place where I felt this intergenerational or 
uh, intergenerational, uh, I don't know what the noun I'm looking for is, but. Mm. Conflict. Okay. Yeah, I thought that was, uh, and sorry, I had technical difficulties, but um, uh, th that was really coming into play, you know, through their college years, older years, career years, um, and then some of it was starting, you know, they were recognizing it in themselves as they were having children too, or not many of them had kids, but I don't remember. But then yet where they go back and they see their mothers coming to the country and they see, I loved the, that she picked the jacket they didn't expect her to. And so the idea of seeing your parent as someone other than just the parent you saw, I don't know. I found that really moving uh, and unexpected because uh, that was then suddenly a leap and you're getting a, a, a somewhat different perspective. And it was where the book started to get a little bit more, I don't know, dreamier and, the world it was exploring that mm -hmm. really continued all the more with the end, but the, the changing perspective that you get of your mothers or your parent parent figures when you start to become the age that you remember them. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a line, it was just kind of a throwaway line, but like something about, and would, would you have carried your, your ass across, you know, to a, new country, new, you know, with nothing in your pocket. Uh, so yeah, it was really acknowledging the, the, the strength that it took and uh, bravery to, to make that kind of move. I think um, I, that whole arc of like going from like, not thinking very much of your parents or their bravery or their courage to to like getting on the same level as them and then like being in awe of them because they have done some extraordinary things because you're older and you have that maturity that resonated so much with me because for the longest time I was just the you know when I was younger I would thought like they should already know this or they're you know this is like a I I don't know the, they should be more acclimated to this country, to this culture, to whatever the case may be. And then later for me, it was like, well, they were kind of insane to have like even come out here and, and even try all of this. And now it's like, I could never, <laughs> you know, I could never do what they did. Like it is shocking. And so the deep respect and all and admiration I have for people who do migrate to other places and start fresh, especially if they don't know the language, they don't know the systems. And, and I'm just like, yeah, I could never. So <laughs> I really appreciated that she captured all of that. Um, and I think that was my favorite part of the book was just seeing how these, these Brown girls matured and, and the way that the relationships around them changed and their worldview changed as a result of that maturity. Yeah. Um, so as most of you know, I have a very small child now and uh, it is so bizarre to read stuff like this and think, oh, it's gonna be her and in whatever, 10, 15 years where she's like actively questioning, like, why aren't you doing X, Y, and Z? Or why aren't you like other parents or whatever? Um, but because I'm third generation on my mom's side and first generation on my dad's and my husband's, um, an uh, immigrant as well, there's like all these different complex layers to like, to that idea of Americanness or establishing yourself. Um, and my husband and I are very much on the same page of, we're not trying to sell in our careers. We just want to like be comfortable and like be able to spend time with our kid. but because there's such uh like this book brilliantly shows like there's such a through line of exception like trying to exceed and being the best so you can um like improve or improve your lot in life but like what if you're at that cusp and you don't care <laughs> and you're like not trying to continue to set a higher standard um what does that look like for children like the next generation of children and uh i'm very curious how authors like like this one or, or other Asian American authors start grappling with the second, third, fourth generations of 
Asian American communities that aren't having to be brave and be bold in the face of not of immigration and uh, figuring out the systems like Fatima was saying. But so far, my kid really likes me. So we're, we're safe for it right now. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, just thinking, I mean, since I'm older than everyone else, um, but I was curious as I was reading, like, how is the later part going to be reflected? And it wasn't like their own old age, but it was understanding that I mean it was almost getting there like where she's at right now the, the author's age uh was just able to acknowledge you know that 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 it was quite a feat you know but um anyway I was just curious how it was gonna like if they were gonna have old if they were gonna get old old like me or older than that even um but uh, anyway it was I thought it was a nice way of uh, uh, sharing what life is like, you know, um, all the many of the phases of life. <clears throat> In the many phases of life, I was really taken back by that last. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure if it was an epilogue or that last chapter. And it was like, we all die. We're all about to die. We're gonna die. And I was like, whoa, whoa. But like. That was like almost the the most fitting way for this for a book like this to end, um, right. because that is such a we thing. Yeah. And knowing the context that the author was writing and finishing the book uh, at the beginning of the pandemic um, does make me, you know, that that feeling of yeah, death comes for us all, even though. It, always comes for us all but that that feeling of facing it as a group is was more prominent in our brains and i i wonder i i don't know how else you would end a book like this something that doesn't have as much of a linear plot it really did serve to to wrap things up really nicely um, maybe nicely is the wrong word because it didn't feel like, and now we're tying the bow on this and the, and the book is done, but it, it served to give a sense of ending. Um, and I wonder if, if she had not been finishing it during that time, is that the path that her writing would have taken? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is an interesting choice. And that, that was one of the things I really enjoyed about the book what you, was you sort of went through time with the girls when they were kids, when they were in high school, then in college, and then like becoming mothers themselves. So for me, it made sense that it was a natural progression in the timeline. I didn't quite know how they were going to, like if, if they were going to die, how were they going to die? Was it going to be mentioned? So I do think it was really well done. And it was a really good way to sort of end the book of the involving this collective we, like we, we all die, we also, we all go on. I think to your point a, a little bit, Emily, too, it's interesting to think about this book and other books is like, just to have to think about the book that you're reading, what time period it is in the book that you're reading, but also when was it being written? And it's like something that you don't always consider. You're not even always like forced to consider it. But I think when you do, when you take the time to consider what was going on around the author when the book was written, it can be really interesting to then apply that to what you're reading. She also mentioned writing it um, when Trump was president and that had effect on some of the things she was experiencing in writing. One of my other favorite moments was the going back to the topic of class was the interplay between those who like move between classes. And so I think the, the vignette where, um, where those who like have the college degrees and that life kind of go back to their hometowns and meet with folks who didn't take that path and, and the relationship and the conversation between the two, I, I was floored because that's something that I've also struggled with. Like, I grew up in Detroit in a predominantly immigrant 
community. And I now live and work in Ann Arbor, which is very different. And, and I, like I spend most of my time at a university thinking, you know, and living in academia and then to go back um, and interact with a lot of my peers who, who sometimes a lot of them that I grew up with are housewives and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's wonderful. And, but I still feel like a sense of displacement and disconnect. And I think she captured that so well um, in those conversations. And I'm just like, notice all the different class things and really, really appreciate that. Cause I haven't seen that before. Yeah, that code switching, uh, which people normally talk about in terms of race and like the culture from race, but and ethnicity, but code switching from class is very real. And um, I notice that when, but I, I don't code switch, there's nothing for me to code switch, but I find myself paying attention to um, how people from who are raised in um, socioeconomic uh, classes that are different than mine, how they speak and how my, my way of speaking is just different. Um, tangentially, a few years ago, I was taking an Uber to the airport and the my driver said, oh, um, before I saw you, I just assumed you were white based on how you spoke. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. No, but I can, I can understand how you see that. Like, um, like it's, it's, I get it. Uh, there's nothing else to discuss with it. Um, but then we were like chatting and he's like, no, but you're like, cool. I was like, well, that took a turn. I was not expecting. Um, and I notice it at, I, I'm just, I am very impressed with the author's ability to capture that, that nuance of what it's like to come back or to be in different spaces that you haven't been in in a long time, if ever. Um, so yeah, I just want to flag that for listeners or viewers of this to look out for that treat. That actually was sort of resonated with me as well. Just the the uh, coming back home after going to college, you know, and a lot of people still living around here. I mean, it's just it happens. I think for for everyone, uh, there's some folks that just stay in their hometown, uh, and I essentially have because I grew up in Ypsilanti. But um, but it's still, you know, it's. I, I was just remembering those times when I'd come home from college, and I must have thought I was something really special too, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, it was each of those different phases. Really, I was. I could. I wasn't totally unrelatable, you know. It was there were there were enough elements that um, it it was a book I'd recommend. So that that says something. <clears throat> Um, despite this being like a book that is about women, um, I'm curious, we still get like quite a bit of like men and the men in their lives. And I'm curious what your thoughts are about the differences between how immigrant men and women and then first, second generation men and women are treated in this book or characterized in this book. The vignette that I keep coming back to is it was one that I remembered most strongly from the first time I read it, rereading it, um, was the family party, uh, where you get the differences of the men and the women and the differences of the generations and the, you know, trying to sneak the booze. Uh, but meanwhile, you have to smile for your aunts and say, yep, college is going great um, or whatever the equivalent of that was. I just loved seeing the different roles that people played in their family and kind of wondering, and how do those roles change when the entire extended family gets together? Um, while it's not perfectly mirrored in my life, I have a very large extended family on both sides. And I could just picture those family parties where you all kind of fall back into your role that you play. And, you know, you, you might be different depending on which uncle or aunt you're nearby and which cousins influence you to do what. It just, it felt very... I felt like home reading that. Um, and I loved seeing the the relationship between the the fathers and uncles and their their kids. Um and their kids getting into trouble, but they're in trouble too. It just it felt very round and warm. I 
I found the parts about um, pressures, characters in the book felt to um, be romantically involved with white men and how the, that whole thing was really interesting to me. Interesting is such a boring word. That's not the right word. Um, but I thought it was just a completely new viewpoint I had not considered. I learned something. That's that's what I unmuted to say. I learned something. For me, I think the the chapter about like the difference in men and women that most resonated was like the pain and um I don't know what the word exactly is, but but the the empathy and compassion perhaps that they felt for their brothers and and the chapter on their brothers was just to me absolutely heartbreaking in a lot of ways because they wanted so deeply to reach their brothers in meaningful ways and have a meaningful relationship with them. And they just couldn't because of, you know, gendered lives and sexism and misogyny and other barriers that keep <laughs> keep uh, emotional intimacy from happening, and, you know, from vulnerability from being happening. And so, so yeah, I, I really, really love that. that it, um, and it's actually the first time where I read something that captured the pain and grief of watching your siblings go through hardship um, in that particular way, like that disconnect and the and the grief that, that results from it. Yeah. Um, I think that ties back really nicely to the earlier points about how first person plural uh, in the books that we've read in that style have been written from the perspective of women. But what we're clearly missing is equivalent for masculinity and men and understanding and detangling where that those barriers start to come up and why there's such a distance that can like the distance just occurs but where does it come from and understanding these the complement to this book would be being brown boys or brown men of like yeah. what are their life trajectories like because it's very difficult to understand pressures or the way your perception of self changes from the outside um i would love to see that yes i'm also like a little bit cynical and thinking that as women are we are typically so and i'm you know i'm talk, talking about my own experience as a cisgendered woman but we are typically socialized to think of the collective and to not think of ourselves as individuals and always have other people in mind and cis men or men boys are typically not raised in that way they are thought treated to think of themselves as individuals and you know I haven't looked at all the other books that exist in the we voice but I do wonder and suspect I'm like is it because is it within the capacity <laughs> to write something that would consider all of that perspective and I don't know I mean, I'm, I feel doubtful, and that's the cynic in me. The thought I was sitting on is that we don't have male authors writing in the we voice because men are individualistic. <laughs> and to be a part of a we, in general, for a man is, is, uh, is to be weak. Mm. And also, if we were to write a book in the we form, we wouldn't move past football. You see what I'm saying? I really mean that. It's not a joke. I really do. Um, That's so tragic. It is. It's the, the emotional processing just isn't there. Shout out. I, I mean, shout out to all the men. But that, <laughs> that was my thought. Um, <laughs> that's what I should have kept muted for. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there are, you know, there's men that could, and it could be pulled yes. off and it would be beautiful to, to see and, um, and, and read and, um, the wide range of things and, and many of them would not end well 
in the same, you know, uh, the boy version, you know, because of the way society is and the way our racist culture is, you know, that more, yeah. Jacob, thank you for putting yourself out there and sharing that with us. Yeah. Um, Because that's something that I probably would not have wanted to speak for of men. Um, But I do think that there are plenty of fiction books written by male authors that share an experience of young men or grown men, be it you know brown, white, or anything in between, that do you do get a glimpse or you do get to to experience those characters, and I think and those are beautifully done, like so many like rich books. But but for me, the thing is just that the the we the we the group, the grouping together, and I do think that with the, there's a certain like. And I don't know, I guess guys have bros or bros or whatever, but for women, I just feel like there's this solidarity of like backing each other up and supporting each other and lifting each other and like protecting them as like, you know, this like weaker sex or whatever. So I, I didn't even think about this book from how it would be done from a male point of view, because like growing up like a young female and experiencing not so much the skin color, but some of these experiences of like womanhood and just growing up and coming of age and the attention of men and like having those experiences it made total sense to me like all right it was just beautifully done this collective we and I think it would be I mean it would be a big task and I'm curious to know if it had what books out there on these lists that, that you pulled up that are that do do that you know if there are books that share the uh, a male point of view a male we also what's magical about this is it's not just like one one experience or one point in time. And I think that's what makes it even more like engrossing or hard to encapsulate is that it's many women from many places with many families from multiple points in their lives. I mean, the commonality is like the, the dregs of Queens and other people who are going through them, some of the similar experiences of them, even though their lives are still different in some ways. It's interesting. It's an interesting concept. And again, Great job, author. So <laughs> I'm curious. I want to I want to peek into the the interview with her. You said it's on Instagram Live on Wednesday. Yes, at six p.m. at Anirais BC. Yeah, I will say. Um, like, I think it also requires a great deal of empathy mm-hmm. to be able to recognize other people's experiences um, and hold them and honor them in the same way that you would your own as an individual. And I think that's very well captured in this and some of the other um, other collective we books that I've read. I think I cut. I would you. also. Uh, oh no! Yeah. I was going to say I think it's a little bit about vulnerability too. Mm-hmm. I think um, that like something about the this book, you know, there, and I don't want to like generalize and say women can admit vulnerability more than men can but I feel like if there was this male writing from this universal this collective we that it it couldn't be as I I don't know I feel like men would be like there would be a lot of men who wouldn't want to admit that vulnerability when they read it or the the that the they wouldn't relate to it as much like all of us you know we've sat here who are female and said well some of this book is relatable because of the female experience. And I, I wonder if there was a collective voice that was male, if there would be as many male readers who would say, yeah, I, I know that because I'm a male, if it was a book that was showing any vulnerable side. And I, and I don't want to sound like I'm generalizing, but I do think that um, there is a little bit about vulnerability. And that kind of goes along with empathy as well too, I think, you know, just you have to be a little bit vulnerable to to feel some empathy so that's true um i was just gonna say jacob when you first started speaking the reason i I was laughing a little bit is that snl sketch from a few weeks ago about um having your straight uh straight male friend um as a respite from all the feelings and all of the intensity that um queer friendships or straight female friendships can bring and that's where i thought you were going (laughs) Yeah. And not like the real talk of, yeah, when you have too many uh, like masculine energies together, nothing gets processed and it's not great either. Yeah, I I had sh- I shared that with Jacob after I watched it. It was hilarious. Yeah. Um, 
that's yeah. This is super tangential, but I feel like it's really um, relate relatable to to what we were talking about. The difference of men and women was I listened to um, a podcast Ear Hustle, and you know it uh, takes you inside. Uh, San Quentin prison. But um, the point of this one was they were talking about men's, it was actually about uh, transgender folks and how they're now able to be uh, incarcerated in their whatever they identify as. But so, uh, they were talking about the uh, graffiti and that women will write, I miss my kids. And like, and it's all like all the graffiti is super positive and loving. And the male graffiti is nobody ever says I miss my kids. It's always about what they're, you know, beefing themselves up, like uh, po being powerful, coming across as uh, ha having power and not being, uh, you know, having any kind of sensitivity at all. So I just, I thought it was kind of an interesting um, concept that, but it's, it's, that's how, that's how a lot of women are, right? We, we're, we would, yeah, we are different. In and it's more societally acceptable for women to show vulnerability. Mm -hmm, exactly. And while that is maybe, maybe slowly shifting a little bit for men, it, it's, it's a very slow process. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, people don't, men with that show emotions still don't look, aren't looked at very kindly um, in the, you know, societally. They take a lot of flack for it. And why the we wouldn't work is that men wouldn't want to claim other people's, other men's emotions, let alone their own. <laughs> Good point. I felt that. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. Um, well, we are at the top of the hour, and I'm so grateful we got to have this conversation. Um, thank you, everybody, for active participation, engagement, um, really lovely insight. And um, we look forward to having the next conversation in May. Uh, the book is on an almost American girl um, by, sorry, uh, by Robin Hopp. It is an illustrated memoir. It is a graphic novel. Um, a really sweet read. And uh, I look forward to discussing that with you all then. Um, like Fatima said, I know this uh, will come out in a week or so, but if you're watching it later, please check out our Instagram at unerasedbc. You can see the interviews that we will be doing. We At that point, we'll have done weird tense, verb tense there, but the interview we mentioned with this week, this month's author and the interviews we've done before. Um, if you're interested in participating in the book club, uh, yourself, please join on the website. We sent a few emails a month, nothing horrible. Um, and thank you again, Ann Arbor District Library, for such a lovely opportunity to talk about books. And thank you so much again for um, facilitating this and for giving us another great book to read. Okay. Take care, folks. <laughs>